Welcome to Lake Toxway United Methodist Church and this service of worship. It is wonderful to see um, faces that are familiar who have returned to your summer homes. It's also wonderful to see first time uh, faces and we're glad you're here. If you're visiting, please feel welcome. If you are here and living in this community, we hope you'll participate as one of us today and know that this is a place where you can be welcomed as a fellow pilgrim following Jesus. I do have two announcements I want to make and then another one. The first one is just to draw your attention to the altar and the flowers that are in memory of Ellen Gasparoni by Sam and Marilyn Gasparoni. The second announcement is to ask those of you who use hearing assisted devices and if you have a T setting, you turn that hearing aid to T, and I'm being broadcast directly to you. Some of you are wearing the headsets. Well, last Sunday, um, because I don't want you to hear me singing, I had <laughs> turned, I turned, I tried to turn it off during the singing of hymns and things like that, and I had the microphone turned off during the sermon, and you couldn't hear me. So if I have it turned off, just. <laughs> Because what I say may be important occasionally, <laughs> and I'd like you to um, let me know that. Uh, the final announcement, we obviously, you, many of you may not know this, but Mother's Day has roots in the United Methodist, or in the Methodist tradition. It was a, a Methodist uh, woman and her mother who conceived of the idea of Mother's Day and who... Uh, wanted to recognize mothers in a special way. It's gone into a $80 billion industry. Uh, I hope some of you um, have planned to take your wife uh, out to lunch or dinner or something later today. If you haven't, you better plan fast. <laughs> but more than that, we all had uh, mothers and we are thankful especially those who had mothers who were able to love them and nurture them in a Christian home. Some of us did not have mothers who were able to do that. Um, and so we are thankful for those women and individuals um, who nurtured us in place of our biological mothers. I'm one of those. Um, I did have a biological mother who I had for many years, but uh, because of issues and illnesses, she was really not able to be a mother. So I was gifted with wonderful women in my life to love me and care for me. I'm also aware that uh, it's a painful day for some of you because you wanted to be a mother, and it did not happen. And so even though we celebrate mothers, I celebrate all women because you bring new gifts and great gifts, uh, the gift of nurture, the gift of compassion, the gift of guidance. And so thank you, and may God bless you in a special way this day. Now we have gathered not to honor mothers any longer, but to worship the one true living God. So I invite you to stand as we share in the greeting you find in the bulletin. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Our Lord has overcome the power of death. In Christ we live forevermore. This is the Lord's doing. It is a marvelous thing in our lives. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let all God's people rejoice. Alleluia. Amen. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. And our hymn of praise is hymn number 304.
then I invite your attention again to the bulletin as together we pray our prayer of adoration and praise. Mighty God, in whom we know the power of redemption, you stand among us in the shadows of our time as we move through every sorrow and trial of this life Uphold us with knowledge of the final morning, when in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life, and forever free to be your people. Amen. You have the appointed scripture passages in the bulletin in front of you. I would invite you uh, to... Follow along if you are one who likes to read as I read, or if you are one who likes to listen, that is fine as well. I remind those of you who are returning, we're still in the season of Easter, and so the first reading, rather than a reading from the Old Testament, is always during the season of Easter, a reading from the book of Acts. And this uh, follows up on last week's story somewhat. It's a story of Peter in the home of Cornelius. He is a devout man. He's a follower of uh, the teachings of the Old Testament. But he's a Roman officer. And therefore, for the Jews, he's a person that was oftentimes despised. And... Peter had been invited by a vision to go to this house where Cornelius lives. Cornelius had invited him, and um, a radical conversion occurs as a result of Peter's response to the direction of the Holy Spirit. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on everyone who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. They heard them speaking in other languages and praising God. And Peter asked, These people have received this Holy Spirit just as we have. Surely no one can stop them from being baptized with water, can they? And he directed that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they invited Peter to stay for several days. Here ends the reading of the lesson from Acts. Our reading from the Psalter is Psalm 98. We will read it responsively. Sing to the Lord a new song because he has done wonderful things. His own strong hand and his own holy arm have won the victory. The Lord has made his salvation widely known. He has revealed his righteousness in the eyes of all the nations. God has remembered his loyal love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Every corner of the earth has seen our God's salvation. Sing your praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of music. With trumpets and a horn blast, shout triumphantly before the Lord, the King. Let the sea and everything in it roar, and the world and all its inhabitants too. And let all the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains rejoice out loud all together before the Lord because he is coming to establish justice on the earth. He will establish justice in the world rightly. He will establish justice among all people fairly. And the epistle reading this morning is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Um, John is expounding on things he has already mentioned and here he says loving God also means loving God's children and he says we can see God's love in our love for each other 
everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born from God. Whoever loves someone who is a parent loves the child born to the parent. This is how we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep God's commandments, this is the love of God. We keep God's commandments. God's commandments are not difficult because everyone who is born from God defeats the world. And this is the victory that has defeated the world, our faith. Who defeats the world? Isn't it the one who believes that Jesus is God's Son? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but also by water and blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Herein ends the reading of the epistle lesson. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? We continue in that uh, lengthy final discourse uh, that Jesus had with his disciples before he went to face his trial, his crucifixion, his death, and his burial. And uh, this is after the Lord's Supper, and Jesus is continuing to teach his disciples some of the important things he wants them to hold and to remember. So he says to them here in this 15th chapter, As the Father loved me, I too have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This is my commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I don't call you servants any longer because servants don't know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because everything I heard from my father I have made known to you. You didn't choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit and so that your fruit could last. As a result, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. I give you these commandments so that you can love each other. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation number 467.
please be seated. Ruth, I think you must have seen my manuscript because that was perfect for the sermon. I know you didn't see the manuscript. <laughs> she looks at the text uh, each week and chooses appropriate hymns and it's always uh, exciting to me how God's Spirit works through me and Ruth and through others to make things have a theme. Will you pray with me? Loving God, your grace is always present with us and the invitation to love is an invitation that sometimes is rather difficult and at other times quite easy. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts lead us to understand your command to love one another. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. And yes, I did overlook the prayer of confession, so we'll use what I just prayed and not do that. When I was um, looking at these texts for this week, and specifically at John 15, and aware that it was also Mother's Day, I was thinking about individuals um, who have loved me and been like uh, mothers to me. Um, I also uh, thought about those individuals, as some of you may think about um, your mothers, particularly if they have already joined the church triumphant. And sometimes when we think about our mothers, we think about the ways in which we have disappointed them. But as I thought about mothers in general and Jesus this week, I thought about a similarity. Oftentimes in a family, mothers are the ones who sit down and explain the details and the reasons why. For example, if the family is getting ready to go on a trip, it's the mom who sits down with the son and the daughter and maybe that third difficult child, which we have in my family. And my wife is good at this. She will explain to my children exactly where we're going, what we're going to do. And from the time they were very small, she would explain to them how they are expected to behave. She tried to prepare them for the change of either going to someone's home for a meal or even going on a trip. She tried to prepare them for that change that was coming up. And for our family, that is my wife and I, that has generally worked very well up until our children have become teenagers. <laughs> and you all laugh because you know that when they get a certain age as a teenager, they know far more than you. And they also say, yes, we know how we are to behave. You don't need to tell us again. And I look at them and say, and if you misbehave, cell phones get put in dad's hand and they, there is a cost you'll Dad will have that cell phone for a while. I have our youngest cell phone right now. And, <laughs> and I have an iPod too. <laughs> but you know, Jesus did the same thing as my wife and many mothers do. He was going away. He was going to complete his earthly mission of teaching. And he was going to face his mockery of a trial, his cruel punishment and death on 
a cross. And yes, we know he also was going to be resurrected. But we also know that Jesus stayed only for a while after his resurrection, and then he ascended to the Father. And so he was preparing in this long section of John's Gospel, Jesus prepared his disciples. He explained to them where he was going, how he was going to go. He explained to them what was going to happen. And that he's going away. And that he's going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with them. But he also lays out some expectations of his disciples. In this Gospel lesson this morning, which is in that final discourse, if you uh, go to seminary, they'll teach you it's called the Final Discourse. In this section, Jesus lays out a teaching about love. And for me, it seems a little bit odd that Jesus lays out that teaching. I mean, who of us thinks we need to be educated about love? We know what love is. Love is having good feelings about somebody else. Love is when something makes us happy and fulfilled. We all know that, right? This is yes. Are you awake? I mean, we've learned from Walt Disney World what love is. Not, not Walt Disney World. Walt Disney what, what love is. Love is something you feel. It's in your heart. We don't need education about that. In fact, we talk about love as if it's something out of our control. We just can't help who we love and who we don't. In fact, popular songs from my day, and this will tell you how old I am, tell us you can't make a heart love somebody. Thank you, George Strait, for that, if you know who that is. Or Bonnie Raitt. Any of you remember her? Your kids probably listened to her. She said, you can't make a heart feel something it won't. And then we all learned that song, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. We talk as if we're at the mercy of our hearts. The mercy, if you will, of love. If we love someone, great. And if we don't love someone, tough. We think this way about romantic love but also about relationships with family and friends. But it seems to me from the teaching of the gospel this morning, somebody forgot to tell Jesus that's the way love works. Apparently, D Jesus did not think that love is just a feeling that we can't control. Jesus thinks that love, and listen closely here, he thinks that love is a command to keep. He tells the disciples, my command is this, that you love each other. And I'm putting myself in the place of the disciples and I'm one of those they are thinking, doesn't he know how difficult it is to love some of these people? And perhaps you could think the same thing as you look at me and say, how does his wife love him? <laughs> He ain't the easiest thing to love. Jesus makes it a commandment to love 
one another. And not only that, he tells them and therefore us to love as Jesus has loved us. And then he goes on to say, Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus didn't get the lesson of our culture. The love Jesus calls us to is a self-giving, self-sacrificing love. It's not about always a good feeling we get from other people. It's not about how we feel in our hearts. It's a command Jesus calls us to obey. It's not about a message of the love that the world teaches. But perhaps you have heard it from your mom. Because this is something mothers teach us. I have said it many times from this pulpit how fortunate I am that my wife and I found each other, that we did find romantic love, that we did commit to each other in a Christian marriage, and that our love has grown in new and deeper ways than I ever imagined 26 years ago. I am fortunate that my wife is the mother of my three children. We're blessed with them. There's the oldest two, always wanting to be compliant and do it right. They make great grades. In fact, my oldest is going to Virginia Tech. Are there any Hokies out there? She's finally made the decision. And our son right behind her thinking about engineering next year. Maggie's going to be an architect. And then there's our third child, Emily, who is a gift to us because she keeps the energy moving in our household. She likes to push the envelope and cause arguments and fighting and disagreements. And Thursday night at my home was not fun. <laughs> and at one point, my two oldest were saying, we hate her. And she was saying back even more vehemently how she didn't particularly like any of us. And my wife said to all of them, look, we don't have to like each other all the time. There is not a commandment for that. But there is a commandment that we love one another. And so we will not say that. And if it's said again, punishment is getting ready to happen. You can say, I don't like the way you're acting. I don't like what you're doing. But we will not say I hate you. That is the command my wife gave to my children. And mothers, fathers, you gave that command to your children too, didn't you? Right? You remember the days? Mm -hmm, thank you. We're not alone. It ain't fun. In fact, what's hard is that they don't like you very much at that point when you're enforcing that rule and, you know, you want to make them like you, but you have to remind yourself that you can't make them like you. You've got to carry out the punishment that you have said you're going to give them. Jesus commanded us that we are to love one another. The Father loved Jesus. 
Jesus loved us. And when we are loved by Christ, we are called to love one another. We don't have to look within ourselves and find the strength to love others. We look to the divine love that flows from the cross of Calvary. From the resurrection of Easter. Yes, from Jesus to us. And we are able to love when we realize that we are loved first. Whether we're a scoundrel, whether we're that agitating third child, or whether we're that perfectionistic first child. We are loved by Christ. And because of that, we are able to keep the commandment to love one another. There's a Methodist preacher who served in Jackson, Mississippi, who was from South Africa. Um, his name is Ross Olivet. He has a dramatic conversion story. He was arrested and placed in prison because of corporate crimes. And by his own admission, he was a mean man out to serve himself as well as the profits of his company. While he was imprisoned, there was a Methodist chaplain who gently and slowly developed a relationship with Ross. And as a result of that, Ross one day accepted Christ and became a Christian. He went to seminary. He eventually became a pastor. And he finally, at the pinnacle of his Christian career, became a president of a seminary. He had a radical transformation because he became a loving, generous man. Before he was living in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, he was just trying to take care of himself but once that he learned God loved him in Christ, that Jesus had given everything for him, he was set free from himself and free to love others. We don't love others with this demanding love because we are nice people. We love because we are first loved. If you can't imagine loving others that way, the way that Jesus loves people, then hear this. God loves you. And Jesus showed the greatest love of all by laying his life down for you. And Jesus gave us the gift of his friendship. He called us, his disciples and us, his friends. And he gave us a commandment. In this lesson, in the final discourse, this is the first time Jesus calls his disciples his friends. 
Before they were students, now they're friends. And he gives them this commandment to love one another. He's shown them so many things about God, about God who heals people, about what God's fulfillment of Scripture is. But ultimately, he gives them a commandment to love one another. Now, Jesus has also said, the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. That sounds like the kind of stuff I want. But in the context of this passage where Jesus gives the great commandment, I think what we ask for is the strength we need to love as Jesus loves us. I remember um, in the church I grew up in when the offering was taken, one of the ushers was appointed to pray. And there was an usher who, he was a regular usher, and he always said this prayer. Give us the grace we need to live as you have taught us, Father. That's the kind of prayer I need to pray. That's the kind of grace God will give as we seek to love as Jesus commands us. Jesus shares with us the gift of God's love and friendship. And these enable us to love one another. And as strange as this may sound, I think the fact that we were given a commandment is a gift to us. Verse 17 in John is best translated this way. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Jesus commands us so that we love each other. The commandment is a gift that makes obedience possible. That's why I'm so glad Ruth had us saying, trust and obey. You know, I have to tell you, I don't often think of a commandment as a gift. In fact, I oftentimes think of it as a burden. I don't like to be told what to do. I want to make my own choices. But you know, having choices sometimes becomes rather frustrating. I mean, just go to the grocery store and gaze up at the cereal wall. I feel completely overwhelmed. And do I believe what's on that cereal box? I mean, that's why I eat Kashi cereal now, because it's supposedly better for me, even though it tastes like salt, sawdust. It's just been packed together. But supposedly it's got all this great protein. Sometimes I see my schedule as a command. And I have to make myself do some of those things. So sometimes having a choice is not always a good thing. But I have a friend who is younger than I with now their fourth child on the way. He's a runner. He and his wife are wonderful parents. I um, watch them as they parent these three young children and as they are expecting their fourth child. He's successful in what he does. And his life is busy. They have to juggle their schedule a lot. And they have to struggle to keep their budget in balance. But that friend of mine runs every single day except for Sunday. 
He gets up at 5 a.m. in order to go for a run that lasts about an hour. And I asked him one time, how in the world do you do that? Don't you some days just get up and, you know, want to say, no, I'm going to stay in bed. And he said to me, no. I find it joy to follow a schedule. Do you hear what I just said? I find it joy to follow a schedule. He says, this becomes second nature to me. I just get up at five o'clock and go for a run. And that's what's made it possible for me to continue running. And every time I hear him say that, I want to respond, well, you know what? <laughs> Eating another, another donut, that sounds difficult too. Maybe if we stop seeing Jesus' commandment to love one another as an option and instead hear it as a commandment, it won't feel like a burden, but like the easiest thing in the world. Maybe over time as we follow the commandment to love one another, It won't feel like a choice we have to make. It will become a gift that we follow. It might become the easiest thing in the world. May it be so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. In response to the spoken word, I invite you to take your hymnals, turn in the back to page number 882. We are using the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed, so many of us, even though we've committed it to memory, it's a little bit different. You may want the words in front of you. So page 882, will you stand as we affirm what we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was the Third. He descended into hell. The people of the Lord will be with you and the Holy Spirit. The Lord is with you. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. be seated. We come to that time in our service where we bring our prayer concerns, believing that God hears, hears and God responds. I'm going to share several names with you, and you perhaps will want to add some names. We continue holding in our prayers Rosie Cantor, that is uh, Marty Young's um, sister-in-law who is undergoing treatment for cancer. Sue Thomas, it's good to see you this morning, but you and John have been in our prayers faithfully. People can tell you that, that we have prayed for you weekly, and we will continue to pray for you even though you're in that period of time where you're off treatments. We uh, continue to pray for Tamsin Freeman and her recovery. I've not had an update about um, how her recovery has gone. Has anyone heard from Tamsin? I think they're planning to be here close to the end of the month. 
We pray as well for Elizabeth Dice. Uh, many of you know Elizabeth and Kevin who will be with us uh, in a few weeks. Elizabeth finished both chemo and radiation and will be doing a monthly injection, but she'll be doing it here uh, in North Carolina. She's going to be here with us for the summer. We also continue to pray for Pat Webb and her recovery. Um, some of you have asked us to pray for Larry Bricker. We continue to pray for him and his recovery. For Joanne Sore, have I got it right? Uh, um, thank you. We also are praying for Jerry and Stephanie Callanan. Are they back? They're coming back. Um, put that, we plan to put the house on the market, and they've made a decision to move to be closer to family. Uh, we pray that things will go well uh, for them as they get things uh, packed up. Rick, we continue to hold you in our prayers and the death of your mother. There are many others who've had uh, losses uh, recently. We also uh, remember um, the Jones boy. Why will his first name not come to me? Ryan, Ryland Jones. Also, um, many of you learned this week about uh, Connie Costigan's uh, cancer, and so we're praying for her, but she does, uh, it sounds like she will be with us later in the summer. You know, Connie lost Bill this, uh, this winter and now facing uh, some issues herself. All of you, I think, by now know that Sherry Minnick fell this week and injured a vertebra, plans to have surgery on Tuesday. We pray for immediate relief for her, and we pray for Bill as well, who's uh, continuing his radiation treatment. Um, we've lost numerous people this uh, winter, and we remember um, some of you here in this sanctuary who are here having lost a spouse and others who will be returning. Um, it's been a difficult winter in the death of so many people connected to this congregation. What other prayer concerns do you have? Yes. Um, thank you. Other prayer concerns that any of you have? Yes. Henry Fair, thank you. Oh, praise God. That is good news. Thank you, Paula. Anyone else? As always, the altar is open as we sing the chorus and prepare to pray. If you wish to join me here, you are welcome to. Uh, but you also may choose to stay in your seats as we bring our concerns before God. God of our mothers, God of love, we joyfully come before you receiving a commandment that when we fully experience your love becomes habit, gift, a commandment to love one another as Christ loved us. And in one of the ways we keep that commandment, O God, is by offering before you in worship names of people 
as a part of this congregation and people who are also connected to those in this congregation. And we pray for the needs they have. We pray for Rosie, for Joanne, for Davy, for Larry, for George and Sue, for Sue and John, for Sherry and Bill, for Elizabeth and Tamson, for those who find themselves in grief after death, for Ryland, for Connie, for Alan, for Henry, for Stephanie and Jerry. Oh God, many of us in this place have silent needs. Perhaps we are praying for our own parents and for the increasing needs they have as they age. Others of us perhaps are praying for, for our health. O oh God, hear the unspoken but very real request of our hearts and fill the places where we become anxious with a trust that you hear and that you are with us and you will not forsake us and enable us to receive answers that may be healing of our mind and hearts rather than of our physical bodies. Oh God, we celebrate answers to prayers that have come in positive ways. We thank you for Paula's sister Sissy and for her improvement. And for others in this place who are living witnesses of miraculous answers. And so, O oh God, enable us to receive whatever your healing is and to live fully in your commandment to love one another as Christ loved us. It is in his name we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in worship as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings. Is a beautiful home of the soul built by Jesus on high. There we never shall die. Tis a land where we never grow old, never grow. Old. Gold in a land where we'll never grow old, never grow old. Never
never gold in a land where we'll never gold in that beautiful home where we'll never more roam we shall be in that sweet by and by happy praise to the king through eternity sing tis a land where we never shall die when our work here is done and our life crown is won and our troubles and trials are o'er all our sorrow will end and our voices will blend with the loved ones who've gone on before never grow old never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old never grow old never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old praise God from him all blessings go praise him all creatures here below Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise God the Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. And let us join together as we pray. O oh Lord, we open our hearts to the absolute wonder of your gift to us. The gifts we bring today are but pale reflections of our gratitude. In Jesus, your heart was fully open to us, and through Jesus, our hearts are open to you. May these gifts provide for the opening of hearts that have yet to know your love and grace. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 310.
hope you are thankful as I am thankful that God gave the commandment to love one another. And thank goodness I don't have to generate that. It comes from the love of Christ flowing through me out to all. So may we leave this place loving one another and all those we encounter. Who knows? They may find God's love in us. We go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.